chapter 10, text number 9. Well, let's first offer our evasions to Shri Prabhupada. Namo Vishnu Vidaya Krishna Prasthai Bhutte, Srimati Bhakti Vidanta Swami Tanamane, Namaste Sarasutun Deve, Koravani Bacharane, Nirvishesha Srinivadi, Paskatyade Satarne. So this is from chapter 10, which is the opulence of the absolute. And this is one of the Chatur Sloki verses of the Bhagavad Gita, which begins with Ang sarvasya pravo, atak sarvam pravartate, iti mata bhajante mam, uda bhavas manvitaha. Basically, which means that, well, the translation is, I'm the source of everything. For me, the entire creation flows. The wise who know this perfectly engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. In other words, Krishna is what's called the sonam bonum. Sonam bonum means that he's the source of all opulence. Everything comes from him. As opposed to the conception of God, which is Ishvara. The conception of God as Ishvara is that he's the controller. But as we know from our Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna is much more than just a controller because if one surrenders to Krishna, then Krishna surrenders to the devotee. So Krishna is not very anxious to control as we in the material world are anxious to control. He's anxious to be controlled by his devotee. Just like Mother Jasoda, she bound Krishna with a rope. Krishna is very happy to be controlled by Mother Jasoda. Or as Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita said, Senayora Obayara Madhye, Vatamas Tapaya Mechuta. Please bring draw my chariot in the middle of these two fields. So Krishna is very happy to act as a charioteer of Arjuna. Probably gives the example of one big Prime Minister of England. And one person had an appointment with that Prime Minister. And when he came on the, to meet the Prime Minister on time, then the Secretary told this man that the Prime Minister is busy at this particular time. Please wait. So he waited an hour, and still the Prime Minister didn't was not available. So he decided to find out what the prime minister was doing that was so important that was keeping him waiting for an hour to see him. So he peeked into the door and there he saw the prime minister was on his hands and knees and on his back was his grandson. And his grandson was saying, giddy up horsey, giddy up horsey. And the prime minister was, was riding his grandson around the room like he was a horse, that the prime minister was a horse. So at that time, the prime minister, England was in fact the, the major world power in the world. And the prime minister was the head of the government. And yet he's acting like a horse for his grandchild. So such is the power of love that even the Supreme Personality of Godhead was the source of everything. He can take the position of a charioteer for his devotee or as a little baby for his beloved parents. So that's the goal of life is to obtain Krishna, a relation with Krishna. There can't be any higher goal than that. Since Krishna is the source of everything, he can't get any better than everything. And the second verse tells us the means by which we can obtain Krishna. 
and Krishna says here, Matsita Matkata Prana, Bodhiantat Parashparam, Katayantasvimam Nityam, Tushanti Cha Ramandicha. Translation of Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami to the Prabhupada. The thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me. Their lives are fully devoted to my service, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss, always enlightening one another and conversing about me. Two brothers purport. Pure devotees, whose characteristics are mentioned here, engage themselves fully in the transcendent loving service of the Lord. Their minds cannot be diverted from the lotus feet of Krishna. Their talks are solely on the transcendental subjects. The symptoms of the pure devotees are described in this verse specifically. Devotees of the Supreme Lord are 24 hours daily engaged in glorifying the qualities and pastimes of the Supreme Lord. The hearts and souls are constantly submerged in Krishna, and they take pleasure in discussing him with other devotees. In the preliminary stage of devotional service, they relish the transcendental pleasure from the service itself. And in the mature stage, they're actually situated in love of God. Once situated in that transcendental position, they can relish the highest perfection, which is exhibited by the Lord in his abode. Lord Chaitanya likens transcendental devotional service to the sowing of a seed in the heart of the living entity. There are innumerable living entities traveling throughout the different planets of the universe. And out of them, there are a few who are fortunate enough to meet a pure devotee and get the chance to understand devotional service. This devotional service is just like a seed. And if it is sown in the heart of a living entity, and if he goes on hearing and chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. That seed fructifies. Just as the seed of a tree fructifies with re regular watering. The spiritual plant of devotional service gradually grows and grows until it penetrates the coverings of the material universe and enters into the Brahma Jyoti effulgence in the spiritual sky. In the spiritual sky, also, that plant grows more and more until it reaches the highest planet, which is called Goloka Vrindavan, the supreme planet of Krishna. Ultimately, the plant takes shelter under the lotus feet of Krishna and rests there. Gradually, as the plant grows fruits and flowers, that plant of devotional service also produces fruits in the watering process and the form of chanting and hearing goes on. This plant of devotional service is fully described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, chapter 19. It is explained there that when the complete plant takes shelter under the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, one becomes fully absorbed in love of God. Then he cannot live without, even for a moment, without being in contact with the Supreme Lord just as a fish cannot live without water. In such a state, the devotee actually attains the transcendental qualities in contact with the Supreme Lord. The Srimad Bhagavatam is also full of such narrations about the relationship between the Supreme Lord and his devotees. Therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam is very dear to the devotees as stated in the Bhagavatam itself. 12, 13, 18. Srimad Bhagavatam Puranam Amalam Advaishnavanam Priyam. In this narration, there is nothing about material activities, economic development, sense gratification, or liberation. Srimad Bhagavatam is the only narration in which the transcendental nature of the Supreme Lord and his devotees is fully described. Thus, the realized souls in Krishna consciousness take continual pleasure in hearing such transcendental literatures 
just as a young boy and girl take pleasure in association. So the verse again. Machita machkata prana, bodhiyantak parashparam, katayantasramam nityam, tushanti charamanti cha. The thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me, the lives are fully devoted to my service, and they derive great satisfaction and bliss from always enlightening one another and conversing about me. This is the message that Krishna repeats throughout the whole Bhagavad Gita. Tasmad Sarveshu Kaleshu, Mama Nusmara Yujata, Mayapita Manobudir, Mama Vaishakya Samshaya. Therefore, our journey, you should, get, you should perform your prescribed duty of fighting. At the same time, you should think of me with your mind and intelligence fixed to me and everything engaged in me, will attain to me without doubt. In other words, we associate with Krishna and we revive our relationship with Krishna by hearing and chanting about Krishna. And as that hearing and chanting develops, then we actually remember Krishna. Now, ordinarily, remembering something shouldn't be so difficult, but Maya does not allow us so easily to remember Krishna. Nor can we remember Krishna just like one can remember a poem or an arithmetic exercise. A Krishna only appears actually appears in the heart of the devotee in remembrance if he wants to. Now, Krishna may appear in some form, but the question is whether Krishna is actually there or not. Just like sometimes we might attend class and it may become questionable at times whether we're actually a class or not depending where our consciousness is at. Similarly, if we want Krishna to be there, we also have to be there. First, we have to be there, and then Krishna will be there. It is not that Krishna doesn't want to be there, or it's not that Krishna isn't there, but he actually only reveals his real nature to one who actually wants him to. And that nature, we can understand, is something, well, the perfection of that nature that Krishna is looking for is found in Srimati Radharani. Srimati Radharani, she, as we know from Chaitanya Charitamrita, she experiences three things that Krishna would also like to experience. Therefore, he comes as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Who knows one of those things that Krishna wants to experience, and therefore he comes as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They're known as the three internal reasons for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance. Since Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance, well, it's pretty far away. Krishna's appearance is closer. But anyhow, who knows one of the reasons for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's appearance? What did he want to experience? One of our scholars. Is that a hand up? Anandarupa does? The hand covered the screen. Of course, Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, Krishna Hatiel. He, so, he got so much in ecstasy, he froze. Such as Krishna Kata, it puts one in ecstasy immediately, remembering Krishna. Okay. Did you say something in Antarupa? I think your screen froze. Oh, простите, пожалуйста, Guru Maharaj. Я говорю, Krishna хотел из изведать то наслаждение, но которое ну снимать. 
Ka. Yeah. Uh, Maharaj, another Rupa Prabhu said that Krishna wanted to experience that enjoyment that Shemati Radharani feels when she sees Krishna. If on Hatil is the second one that she he wanted to understand his own sweetness. Okay. Well, not quite sure. I mean, it's almost Mojavit Mi Delico Bliska. But the first one, anyone else have any ideas? Yeah, these are um, yes. You can anticipate this thing to come. That's his external reason, supposedly. It's not ex external from material, but that's what he manifested to people. First one, Krishna wanted to experience his sweet, how Shimati Rarani experienced his sweetness. <laughs> Krishna is all, Krishna's love, Shimati Rarani is unlimited, but he can't experience, he experiences his own love, but he doesn't experience the love, uh, how Shimati Rarani experiences that love, is sweetness. Second is that Krishna has unlimited qualities, but only Shimati Rarani can actually experience those qualities to the fullness. So Krishna wanted to experience his qualities the way Shimati Rarani experiences his qualities. And the last one, is that Shimadhi Rarani has unlimited ever-growing love for Krishna, which is full of sweetness. But only Shimadhi Rarani can experience that sweetness of her love. So Krishna wanted to experience how in the position of the ashraya of love, that how Shimadhi Rarani experiences love for him. In other words, Shimati Rarani enjoys the exchange between Radha and Krishna more than Krishna does. So Krishna wanted to experience the same amount of happiness that Shimati Rarani experiences in their loving exchanges. Therefore, he came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In other words, it's more fortunate to be a devotee of Krishna than to be Krishna. So we don't have to worry about becoming Krishna. Although some people in this world do worry about becoming Krishna, but that's not really our goal. But it's more important to try to become a devotee of Krishna. So here it says that the way we can become a devotee of Krishna is by associating with him. And the way we associate with him is by utilizing what Krishna has given us and desiring to utilize those assets in Krishna's service, namely our mind, intelligence, and our, our energy, our life here, our, our, our lives, devote, our, our activities in Krishna's service. So first is activities, and Krishna says our activities have to be regulated. Regulated means we have to find out what Krishna wants us to do. It is not that we do anything that we like to, because hopefully if we're engaged in devotional service, we like to do it. But our first business is not to do whatever comes to our mind, but to do whatever comes to Krishna's mind. In order to do that, we have to find out what Krishna wants us to do. Now, we know what Krishna doesn't want us to do, hopefully. Therefore, we're given at the beginning four activities which are considered to be sinful, such as illicit sex, meat eating, gambling, and taking intoxication. Now, most people in this world nowadays do not think that these things are sinful, nor do they, most people even believe there's such a thing as sin. They think lust is love. And why should we deny love or lust? 
of course, even nowadays, greed is considered to be a highly auspicious quality. The more money you have, the more you're valued in society. The more you come close to the goal, become as greedy as possible. And of course, anger is even considered a noble quality nowadays. If you utilize it to destroy your enemies, then you're considered to be a hero. But these things are not considered to be very desirable in terms of self-realization. And therefore, we're asked to refrain from the sources, the original source of lust, which leads to greed and anger and illusion and everything else after that, by refraining from those four activities. But that's negative. Krishna also wants to do something positive, and therefore he's given us the opportunity for devotional service, of which Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smarnam are the most predominant because the other ones, such as service to Krishna, worshiping the deities, offering prayers to Krishna, and offering everything to Krishna, uh, these depend upon hearing and chanting in order to do them. Because by hearing about Krishna, if we hear with the right attitude, then there's a possibility of Krishna explaining to us what we just heard. In other words, explaining to us what we just heard is that Krishna has to reveal himself in the words. The words about Krishna are not ordinary words. They're transcendental words, and they're all non-different from Krishna. So it depends upon our attitude of hearing. Now, the worst attitude, well, I don't know what the worst attitude is, but there are many different attitudes. But the, the most desirable attitude is submissive. Submissive means, as it says in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, we don't accept blindly what we're hearing, because that's called blind following, nor do we reject it blindly. But instead, we try to hear in such a way as to be receptive, so that we can. To do that, you'll need to turn off airplane mode. Thank you. Siri. <laughs> What's that? Siri. Yeah. It's even my computer's off, it's still working. Such as our computer. In our computer age, they're so kind, no one else will listen to us. But even when our computer's off, there are people, if we talk, there are people listening to us. So if you're frustrated, no one wants to listen to you, be rest assured, there's a whole lot of people listening to you. Maybe not for the best motives, but at least they're listening. So, to hear submissively requires some previous pious activities. In other words, to have that taste for hearing requires some experience of positivity in hearing. There must be some experience that by hearing, or that by hearing we led to some experience so that we got a higher taste, we got something desirable in our lives from that hearing. For instance, nowadays, <clears throat> hearing is very important in the world. And the internet and other means are constantly telling us the glories of different things in the material world, how wonderful they are, how wonderful this computer is, how wonderful this place is to go to, how Hawaii is full of nice beaches, or as Prabhupada says, actually, during the winter in England, there's a lot of advertisement 
of how nice it is to go to India because it's warm. And in India, where it's very warm and hot, there's advertisement, fly to England because it's nice and cool. So in this way, people are encouraged to do something in order to find some happiness and satisfaction is advertisement of where it's found. So also our, our books advertise that happiness is found in loving service to Krishna. And Krishna is manifested himself in many different ways in this world, principally in the holy name. In Kali Yuga, he's principally manifest in the holy name. Uh, therefore, we're trying to hear the holy name, and the best person to hear the holy name from is someone like Srila Prabhupada, who's chanting in full ecstasy. Not as a controller of the material world or any part of it, but it's simply a, the most humble servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna, calling out to Krishna to engage him in his loving service. And even though Srila Prabhupada was in full transcendental ecstasy, he didn't become proud that I'm a great devotee. As a matter of fact, the more ecstasy he feels, the more he feels like a humble servant of his spiritual master, that his spiritual master is so kind that as he feels himself more and more fallen and helpless and dependent on his spiritual master, so the more his spiritual master transmits the ever unlimited mercy of Krishna to his disciple, and therefore his disciple feels ever more indebted to his spiritual master for lifting him up from the fallen condition he imagines himself to be in. Therefore, as one progresses in devotional service by hearing about Krishna, one sign of progress is actually feeling ever more dependent upon the orders of Krishna and his representatives. Ever more humility, understanding that humility comes from experiencing how wonderful Krishna is which is unimaginable to a conditioned soul, but at least we should understand that even to see the sun in the sky and have a little feeling of wonder at how great Krishna is, that he was able to put this massive ball of fire in the sky and have it circulate or revolve in an orbit around the universe and provide all living entities in the universe with an adequate amount of heat and light. Even a little feeling of gratitude towards Krishna and appreciation for Krishna's unlimited power is also a little bit of humility. But to personally understand Krishna, that's even an experience how wonderful Krishna is personally. Not only his energies, how wonderful they are, and they all are wonderful because they're coming from a wonderful person. Rasha Shakti Ravi Vidaya Vishnu Yate Swabhavati Jnana Balakriya Cha. They're all acting in a, in a wonderful way because Krishna is wonderful and everything about him, including his energies. Are also wonderful. These energies can most be directly perceived by us now in this material world that we're living in, because for the most part, until we become advanced enough, we don't have access to the spiritual world. But we do have access to the spiritual world, although part of that access to the spiritual world is the hearing chant about Krishna. And especially it mentions here an association of devotees. 
For this reason, Prabhupada started the Hare Krishna movement. He could have just written books and try to sell them. But, and he also could have just made devotees and have them sell the books. But that wouldn't have worked. No one can go on distributing these books unless one has some taste for what's in the book. Of course, service by book distribution is also following the book. But we should not do it blindly. We should know why we're distributing the books, why we're chanting the Holy Name in public, because everyone has a relation with Krishna. And these books teach one how to revive one's relation with Krishna. So we also have to read the books, but we should read them with each other, together, in association of devotees. Because in the association of devotees, we can become inspired. If the devotees become happy by hearing about Krishna, then we also can understand that there's a possibility of our becoming happy by hearing about Krishna. If we have some doubts about what's said in the books, we can inquire from other devotees and they can give us realizations which we can also appreciate that we didn't have. That way we can understand that we don't know everything about Krishna already. Sometimes in certain parts of the world, if you go and tell people about Krishna, they all say, oh, I know about Krishna. I know more than you about Krishna. I know about Krishna throughout my whole life. You have nothing to tell me. Or as some sannyasis were in India and they went to some Pajari to see the deity. They went to some deity to see some deities. And the Pajaris were very happy to see the devotees, two sannyasis. And the Pajaris said, you're very fortunate. You've come to see the deity. That's because you're distributing books and preaching around the world. So if you keep on doing that in your next lifetime, you can become a Pajari and worship the deity here in India. So the sannyasis told Prabhupada that. And Prabhupada said, you should go and tell the Pujari that if you're a good Pujari and you worship the deity very faithfully, then in your next lifetime, you can take birth in the West and preach Christian consciousness around the world. Therefore, this hearing and chanting with devotees is very important because there's so many advantages of hearing from others and explaining to others about what our particular realizations are. As a matter of fact, generally speaking, unless we tell someone about our realizations, we don't really even know what they are. <laughs> Therefore, I was explaining that we should form into small groups and meet regularly so that we can hear something about Krishna and then get an opportunity to, talk, to tell each other about what we've understood, about what we heard. And it's not exactly our own, our only our personal realizations. It's actually the realizations that Krishna is giving us when we preach. As the devotees would say, sometimes they'd see Prabhupada, he'd be reading the Krishna book. And they were surprised because generally the author of a book doesn't spend a lot of time reading his own books because he wrote them. So they were surprised to see Srila Prabhupada reading the Krishna book. And they asked Srila Prabhupada about that. And he said, actually, I'm reading these books because I didn't write them. Krishna wrote them. Similarly, when we're talking about Krishna, it is not exactly we by ourselves are saying something about Krishna. 
Dadami Buddha Yogam Tam. Uh, Krishna is giving us the intelligence to say something. And even though we may not have a whole lot of realization, we may be hum we may be shy or whatever else, but we should su be surprised in the association, especially devotees who are interested in hearing what we have to say, we'd be surprised what we can actually say about Krishna and what effect it has on us. Otherwise, sometimes, like in this class, devotees may go on listening for years at a time to classes, but they never get an opportunity to say something about Krishna. But that's not what Krishna says in this verse, Parashparam. It should be some back and forth discussion. Even Arjuna was confused in the Bhagavad Gita. Still, he asked Krishna questions. Krishna gave the answers. And even at the end, Krishna asked Arjuna questions. Similarly, throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's Parashparam. Amongst themselves, there's Bodhiyantak. Vidura is asking Maitreya questions. Maitreya is giving answers. And sometimes Vidura is speaking, explaining his understanding. Riksha Maharaj asked relevant questions. And he got the answers back from Shukadeva Goswami. It wasn't that Shukadeva Goswami for seven days and nights simply spoke. Riksha Maharaj had his eyes open, but he was actually asleep. It's hard to listen for seven days and nights without falling asleep. No, there was a, a reciprocation between what Priksha Maharaj was hearing and what he inquired from Shukadeva Goswami. And even Shukadeva Goswami was quite happy to hear Priksha Maharaj's questions. Now in a class like we're having now, when there is a good number of devotees, not everyone's going to get a chance to ask the questions that are really within their heart. They may be embarrassed, or it may not be, they may not think it's 100% relevant, or for different reasons, there may not be time to ask the question, or other people have asked questions and we didn't write our question down, so we forgot what it was. But in a small group, where we have our friends, and if we give an ask a question, which is not of the highest quality, still, people will not criticize us. We won't be embarrassed. And if we explain to something or to someone about what our understanding is, then people if there are friends and interested in Krishna service and helping the devotees, they'll appreciate our understanding of Krishna consciousness. Even Srila Prabhupada had his disciples, even as early as 1968, give classes in public. Like during Jamasami in Montreal, instead of just speaking himself, Prabhupada had his disciples speak about Krishna but they understood. Therefore, even if we don't have any friends, even if it's just me, or, me and my husband, or me and my, my cat, still we should, of course, cats don't usually respond so well, but anyhow, me and my husband, or me and my children, whatever, still we should, hear and chant together. As I said before, that's the duty of a sannyasi to inspire the grihastas and the brahmacharis and the vanaprastas appropriately. So for the grihastas especially, since they're busy in many different activities, they really have to take some time every day to hear and chant about Krishna. Not only chant their rounds, 
because we chant our rounds, they're sometimes not of the highest quality. As I've repeated that mantra many times that I've heard the Bodhis chant, including myself sometimes. Schnick, schnick, ram, ram, day, 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 day. Hey, kitty, kitty. Hey, kitty, kitty. And we can go on years and be satisfied. I'm chanting my rounds. I'm doing my duty and getting my rounds done. I'm a nice devotee. Surely Krishna will show us his mercy. I mean, my, his mercy. And others listen to us and think, oh, my, this poor devotee. He can't even chant Hare Krishna. He's so much an illusion. But I can't tell him that. Because if I told him that, he'd get angry at me. And therefore, I had one more enemy to add to my list of devotees. One more enemy amongst the devotees to add to my list. But in a smaller group where these things are actually become normalized to reveal one's mind and confidence when there's some trust that it won't lead to antagonism, that we can actually be free to express ourselves to other devotees, then this leads to a lot more progress so that we can actually chant Hare Krishna instead of something which is maybe Nama Parad or at best, Nama Bas. So this is necessary to develop relations with devotees who we can actually reveal our mind and confidence to, Com reveal our mind about Krishna, not about how I hate this person. <laughs> or actually, my real ambition in life is to become rich and famous, but I wouldn't tell anyone because that would be embarrassed, but I can tell you. Of revealing one's mind and confidence means specifically to tell what our realizations of Krishna are and what our understanding of Krishna consciousness is. And inquire confidentially to be appreciative of other devotees, how they understand Krishna, how they appreciate Krishna, how they've developed Krishna consciousness. As a matter of fact, the greatest advertisement for Krishna consciousness is not what Krishna says in his own books. It's not even what the devotees say about Krishna in his books. It's when the people, they express publicly what they have understood, what they have experienced in Krishna consciousness. And other people become impressed that here is a living person they have an experience, they have a testimony to tell us, and they've gotten something positive from it. So if they can, if this person could obtain something positive from Krishna consciousness, surely I can also. As a matter of fact, generally testimonies in every field. Even 50 years ago, people were giving testimony about how they smoked cigarettes and became healthy. Even the advertisements are always happy people doing unhappy things. Even the person who's advertising one cigarette company, by one cigarette company, always riding a horse, always had a smile on his face when he was smoking the cigarette. Unfortunately, he developed lung, lung cancer and died. And even the horse that he was riding on got lung cancer and died. <laughs> Still, people are impressed by the testimony by some attractive person apparently taking happiness from that activity. Therefore, when we express to each other the happy results of practicing Krishna consciousness, that's the most encouraging thing to hear from others, how they understood Krishna consciousness and how it helped them in their personal lives.
that develops more deep faith than just by our own personal experience. Therefore, our first business is to hear about Krishna, and then in the association, devotees hear about Krishna. Because if it's not possible, we can listen online, or we can read through Prabhupada's books. That's also very nice. But still, we need the association devotees to tell others about our realizations. And if there are no other devotees, at least go, with faith, go before the deity and talk about what you've understood. Krishna will actually listen to you. And he'll reciprocate also. But it, that requires some faith. Rishula Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada used to say, if there's no one else in the room, then at least talk to the four walls. Now, I'm not going to tell you they're listening. Still, but at least you can listen to your own realizations. For that reason, Rishula Prabhupada wanted us to write every day. Because by writing, we're in touch with the super soul. And what we write down may not be exactly everything that we're conscious about Krishna, but Krishna within our heart will reveal to us what we've actually understood so that we can become aware of what we've understood. So again, this Parashparam, this preaching, is best done in the association of other like-minded devotees, as Krishna will say at the beginning of the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita, the beginning of the devotional six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, Maya Saktamanak Partha, Yogam Yunjan Manashaya, Asamshayam Samagramam Yata Gyasitachina. So here from Yosana Pritha, how by practicing yoga in full consciousness of me, with the mind attached to me, you can know me in full, free from doubt. So touch you knew, hear from it. And how do we hear from Krishna? Krishna will explain that in the ninth chapter, Idam Dute Guyatamam, Prabhaksham Anushuyave, Gyanam Viganam Saitam, Ejgyatva Moksha Se Shubhat. There, because you are never envious of me, Arjuna, therefore I'll explain to you this most confidential, this most, uh, what does he say? But confident and realization, which knowing which you shall be relieved of the miseries of material existence. And Prabhupada writes in the purport, the devotees are constantly engaged in Lord, Supreme Lord's service. The Lord understands mentality and sincerity of a particular living entity who's engaged in Krishna consciousness and gives him the intelligence to understand the science of Krishna in the association of devotees. Discussion of Krishna is very potent, and if a fortunate person has such association, tries to assimilate the knowledge, then he will surely make advancement towards spiritual realization. So we have to understand that the most important quality for ourselves to advance in Krishna consciousness is our relation with the other devotees. That we have to be very careful in that association with devotees because if we have a humble service attitude towards the devotees, then we'll be able to hear from them. And only if we hear from them can we actually understand Krishna will reveal himself. Even when we're speaking about Krishna, we should understand that it's not exactly me speaking. Ultimately, by the mercy of my, the acharyas and disciples of succession and their representatives, I'm able to say something by their mercy and by the mercy of the super soul. And when I'm speaking, I should also listen so I can understand how to apply within my own life what I'm telling others to do. As a matter of fact, one time Shri Prabhupada was 
explaining that when a spiritual master speaks to his disciples or followers, then he understands that it's not exactly himself who is speaking, or it's not exactly his instructions, but by the mercy of his spiritual master and by the mercy of Krishna, he's remembering, by which should say, by the mercy of his spiritual master, Krishna within the heart is giving him remembrance of what Krishna has said. And when he tells that to others and they apply it within their lives, he understands they're actually serving his spiritual master and disciple succession. So he learns from his followers and disciples how to become a better servant of his spiritual master by their example of serving those instructions. In other words, whatever opportunities we have to associate with devotees, we should try to take advantage of it. And if we can arrange it in such a way as to regularly meet with each other and talk about Krishna, then this is our greatest opportunity to not only remain in Krishna consciousness, but also become enthusiastic to advance in Krishna consciousness. And not only enthusiastic to advance in Krishna consciousness, but also enthusiastic to do service according to our inspiration, according to our experience, according to our heart, according to our abilities, to sacrifice our energy in Krishna service. And if we do that, then we'll also be anxious and enthusiastic to tell others about Krishna. Because we'll experience the happy result of participating in Christian consciousness. And naturally, uh, as we develop love for others, we'll want to give them this opportunity to also develop their relation with Krishna. So I'll read the verse again. Much sita, much kata prana, orientash parashparam, katayantas from nityam, tu shanti chara manticha. The thoughts of my pure devotees, they dwell in me, their lives are surrendered to me. They derive great satisfaction and bliss by enlightening one another and conversing about me. So I'll stop here. Thank you for your kind attention. And I'll ask if there is any questions. Arthur Sarti. Krishna Guru Maharaj, thank you so much for the honest and sincere class that you gave to all of us. Um, Regarding to the point of relationships, I was speaking with one of my god siblings and uh, we came to the idea that uh, to make small groups, like you mentioned, to study a little bit more in depth the scriptures, but mostly not so much to become a scholastic, but to know each other and to develop a strong bonding and uh, and to help each other uh, grow in, in Krishna conscious through our realizations. So what do you think if this will be a good idea? Of course, this will depend on the availabilities and the desire of, of each one. But what do you think, please? Well, since that's what I've been talking about, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> and since that's what okay. Krishna talks about, I have to confirm, I think Krishna has a lot of good ideas. And that's one of the main ones. So I support Krishna. Thank you, Rumaharaj. Of course, it, it requires a little bit of uh, encouragement and decision because uh, not everyone has the same um, like uh, disposition, not probably or availabilities, but this is something that we need to to figure out, I suppose. Well, if we. Number one, if we can tolerate, if we can understand a little bit about our humble position that we're actually in. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Ayananda Tanuja Kinkaram Patitamam Vishame Bhavam Budo, that I'm a little tiny soul and I've fallen into the ocean material existence. I'm not this big body with this big false ego. I'm actually a very small soul struggling within the material energy. So if we can understand that, 
then we can tolerate others who are also struggling like we are. Then if we can learn tolerance, then we can also learn appreciation for even little things. Considering whatever service we do, in Krishna's eyes, is very big, but actually it's very small. If we offer some wonderful prasadam to Krishna that everyone appreciates, it is not that Krishna doesn't have Mother Jasoda can't equal our prasadam or Srimati Rarani can't equal our cooking. But finally, Krishna got a good meal. No, to the best of our humble capacity, we try to offer something to Krishna with love. Similarly, if someone else is offering something to Krishna, to the best of their ability, some appreciation should be there. But that, that depends upon humility, tolerance, and appreciation. And that will give us the higher taste by which we can advance in Krishna consciousness. Without that appreciation or elementary love for the devotees, it's not possible to please Krishna. Nor is it possible to understand the science of pure devotional service. And as far as ability, availability goes, that will be taken care of if we get happiness from association with the devotees. Just like no one has to put on their schedule every day for shadam time. It's not that we have, have to make available time for eating. It seems to be always there. So if we get happiness from Krishna consciousness, from association with devotees, we'll find time to associate with very true. Thank you for your question. And we have one. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. We have one in Russian. Do you want to translate that? Mother Levangalata? Yes, yes. Uh, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, obeisances. Uh, this is from Bhaktin Elizabeth. Um, but uh, could you please tell us about something? Uh, what you say, what, what, what do you call, um, in, in the small groups, you said that we should speak and reveal our mind confidentially. What does it mean? Does it mean that we also have to share a technical moments? Uh, people were telling me that um, uh, uh, things that I experience in my uh, personal um, heart with uh, Krishna, it could be offensive. Uh, it's too too confidential. Is that true? Well, I'm just. Could you please just tell us what we should reveal and what we shouldn't reveal? Well, I have no idea. In terms of, depends on time, place, and audience. That takes some proper instruction. What? How to? How to engage? Just to say to engage in small groups, that's a good suggestion, but it takes some training how to do that properly. How to reveal one's mind and confidence depends on many factors. First of all, it should be productive. Not that we reveal our mind and confidence and the next day it's all over the, <laughs> the internet. <laughs> that would not be very encouraging. No, we have to be have we have to be confident also that within our group that what we say stays in the group and that what we say has meaning to the person we're saying to. Not that we tell someone about last night I in my gopi form I went to, to play with Krishna and the kunjas of Vrindavan. Let me tell you about it. I mean that may be far beyond the level of understanding of the person we're talking to. If at all, we can actually claim to have such experience. But practically, how did, you know, there are things that we can ask about. Like, how do you, how can I improve my rounds? How can I follow the principles more easily, regular principles, how I can get up earlier? There are some things that are just practical matters we can discuss with each other. 
which may be more helpful than telling about my realizations in the Kunjas of Vrindavan, in this in Goloka Vrindavan. More relevant issues to deal with. How to organize our time, that may take some training, but that's what that's what this is all about. But at least we have to do it. At the very least, if we just sit down and we read a passage about Krishna and everyone talks about it, that's at least the beginning. Exactly how to further that, well, that there, there are groups have been doing this for decades, if not centuries. According to Bhagavad Gita, it's been going on eternally. So there is a science of how to talk about Krishna. That science is already there in conversations in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and especially between Krishna and Arjuna. So we can study these conversations and see how to apply them in our own conversations in terms of Krishna consciousness. Other practical matters can be there also. There's like if householders meet together, it's much more likely they can discuss, for instance, how to change diapers in Krishna consciousness. Now, when brahmacharis are meeting together, it may be a little confusing to them, <laughs> these particular topics. But it may be more relevant for householders and may be actually very important for householders for their advancement in Christian consciousness. Yes. Tirtapad. Uh, yes. Hare Krishna Gurudev, thank you very much for the class. It'll be a, it'll be a nice one to revisit. Um, I was just thinking about, I had a question about uh, Prabhupada's father that, uh, his name's Gormahan Prabhu. Gormahan, yes. Yeah. Uh, he, Prabhupada remembered that he would invite many sadhus to their their home. And, but Prabhupada, wasn't particularly impressed by many, if any, of them, um, and I just, I just wondered why, why was um, his father not inviting like more Vaishnav studies rather than perhaps impersonalists? This India is full of Mayavadis and, and Sahajis. To find an actual genuine Vaishnav is very difficult. Still, it's the duty of the householders who invite even people who are somewhat renounced to invite someone, or else you think I'm the, I'm the only one who's true Vaishnava. Everyone else is false. Therefore, I just eat everything. Because <laughs> only Krishna eats through the Brahmins, and I'm the only Brahmin, so I have a lot to eat. <laughs> no, a devotee like Gaur Mahan, he, can, he could appreciate even persons who are not genuine, completely genuine, he appreciated that at least externally they were showing some signs from renunciation. And he felt it was their duty, his duty as a householder to even feed them. So we cannot understand exactly what the mentality of Gormahan was. But if there was actually genuine Vaishnavas, then Gormahan also invited them. He invited Prabhupada's god brothers and fed them also. But probably just mentioned that out of all the persons that came to his house, none of them could compare to his Guru Maharaj, the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. That's all in comparison. They all seem very insignificant in comparison. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Grantaraj, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Kijai, Srila Prabhupada. Thank you very much.